Hi, welcome hey, back guys. to Wild Speculations. I'm Daniel. I'm Scott. Tonight we talk about episode 45, The Stowaway. Or Stowaway? Yes. Stowaway. Yeah. Uh, so, first things first, most of what we speculated was wrong. Yes, we, enjoy, we enjoy celebrating the correct. We need to laugh at when we're wrong. And about 99.9% .9 of what we speculated was wrong. Yes. So I only say that instead of 100% because I did my end. I agreed with you on the monk for the, but my end was just I wanted her to be a foil for someone. And she was Yeah. on a couple of levels for both not and Jester. So as the episode was going on, I... It, her performance triggered a memory in me. Okay. And I think it was in an interview with d, &D Beyond. Okay. Around the stream of many eyes. Okay. I'm pretty sure she mentioned Twiggy in that interview. Mm -hmm. And later, it's sort of a throwaway line that Matt says in the dragon fight. You roll so well, you stealth into your previous campaign oh yeah uh so twiggy like uh, um darren de paul's gnome sprig sprig uh which relationship related no i didn't think so but i did see that what if sprig was twiggy's dad <laughs> uh but no um so, I wasn't a hundred percent wrong either in that I was saying she would be in her comfort zone. Yeah, I just at the time I didn't remember her mentioning Twiggy. Yeah, and so we're, we're going to pull that out just to save a little face, but we were basically a hundred percent wrong. Yeah, and I'm totally okay with that. That's part of the fun of this. You yeah, know? Um, I have to say though. Matt's decision to put her as a stowaway was much better than getting them to the island. Yes. Because that enabled Twiggy to be introduced around the 20 minute mark. Yeah. Um, and that includes the announcements. Yeah, the announcements and the recap and the intro. Yeah, and so really only like 10 minutes of show time if that. was all they had waited yeah. to bring her on, which was great. Yeah, it was really great. And I'm sorry, I'm probably going to get a lot of hate for this because it's not a popular opinion. But Deborah Ann Wall plays the perfect Kender. This is, a, this is just, it <laughs> makes me want them to bring Kender back. They were in the beta test. I love Kender. That, people, that's how you play a Kender. Yeah. Uh, as, as soon as she started describing pulling stuff out of the pack and there's like feathers and all this random stuff i was like oh my god she's a kinder yeah um and there were a couple times in the fight where i was like she can just move through the dragon square mm -hmm. and i was like wait nope she's not a half one <laughs> uh yes. yeah uh but right off the bat we have a great moment for Travis yes. in the episode where all of the players ask him how long until we get there. And he says about three days, three or four days. Mm -hmm. And then he looks at Matt for confirmation and Matt goes, about three or four days. Yeah. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, <laughs> They're all, you got it. You actually did it. Yep. Uh, the power of note taking. <laughs> I don't know if it's necessarily note taking. It, it wasn't. I think it's just him just realizing how far on that map that they've been traveling and how long yeah. it's been taking. Yeah. And him just kind of going, okay, it's going to be that long. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a good moment for him. And then later in the episode, we had basically Travis returning to form. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to remember that. Sure, I'll remember that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I have to say, I think 
the I think some fans and Travis probably even himself beats himself up too much. Yeah. Over not remembering stuff. Because we have one of my I, I, players. I think complains, it's more Travis than the community. The community likes to focus on Marisha. And I, I don't see I, I don't see too much negativity towards Travis most of the time. No, well, or the, towards you know calling yeah, out his well, that's, missteps. That's true. Uh, but yeah, I I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed that moment for him. I, I did too. Yeah, that was that was good. Uh, and Matt is about to basically. He asked, "Okay, you guys take the long rest. What are you doing for the rest of the journey?" And Sam's like, "I have a I, few, I have a small list." <laughs> Which is exactly what Talison did. Every time there was downtime, Percy's like, yeah, I have a list of things I need to make. Yeah. So I in my so now not is danger Percy to me. Because <laughs> where Percy and Talison understood the safety measures that you need to take when you're working with Neither Sam nor killer. not do. <laughs> That's awesome. Chad's like, oh, you gonna go do that up in the crow's nest? No, we do it around on the cannon deck where the gunpowder is. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so and and here's what I think may happen. Okay, I don't think Nine is gonna multi class just yet, but when they release the gunslinger on D and D Beyond. There was a feat that Matt created, which allows you to gain proficiency with firearms, and you know, for so anyone could use firearms mm. and be a little better than just average with firearms. I think that's the feat Knot's going to take at eighth level at rather eighth than multi classing. Rather than multi classing, because even if she multi classes, she's got to go fight her way till third level to become fighter to become the gunslinger archetype. Yeah, I but fighter that's... gives her some good stuff. It does, but I'm not sure that's where Sam is taking not. No, I don't think so either. So I, but I, I could see him picking up the either the gunslinger feet, yeah, or the firearms feet, or uh, just the weapons training feet. Yeah, um, she could do that because then she could pick up whips, firearm guns, and mm -hmm. if she did pistols and rifles, because two of the four, yeah, then she's got one more to play with. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what she would do. I don't know. Falchion. <laughs> Can I see that for <laughs> Yeah, because she's already net. Yeah, I could see that. I, I could see her doing that. Um, but anyway... Neither here nor there. Um, my other favorite moment early in the episode is when Sam's like, I know I have something to avoid this damage. And, he, and he's like, I should know this stuff. It's and like, yes, you should know your stuff. Just like the paper clip on the old computers. <laughs> Liam, I see you're trying to do a rogue action. <laughs> Well, and he did the hand, hand Booker Helper episode yes. for the road. Uh, so yeah, that yeah, a lot of good, a lot of good table moments in this episode, as well yeah. as uh, in game yeah. moments in this episode, uh, and some big ones for the clerics. Yeah, uh, vis a vis. Uh, their role playing, mm -hmm. and I think there was a powwow had. I don't know if it was just between Talison and Laura. I don't know if Matt was involved. I don't know if they got together with somebody else. Okay. But in this episode, both of them, and maybe it's because they can take divination as a spell now. Right. That that's in their head. So now they're looking for stuff. 
right off the bat when Knot says there's something down there. Yeah. It's the Traveler. Yeah. And right off the bat, when she sees Twiggy, she sees everything in the reflection of her. Yeah. And instant love, instant everything. I love the three of them playing off each other, and Bo basically ended up being the... No, seriously, who the fuck are you? Wouldn't it be great if Fast Forward to the Solstice and Traveler Con and Twiggy makes another guest appearance? Comes back a second <laughs> yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. That would be awesome. And it also... Deborah kept folding up her character sheet. Mm -hmm. And at first, I thought that Jester taking to her the way she took to Knot was also because she knew that Knot was a rogue and, you know, trickster clerics and rogues. Right. Hand in glove. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know if they knew that she was playing a rogue. Yeah, and no, and I, and I think she was doing that because when she's when Talison cast detect magic, she's like, "Oh, does he know? Should I show him?" And started to open, and then he, Matt was like, "No, he just..." Knows. And she folded it back up real quick. Yeah. So I think she was doing it to keep the air of mystery of Twiggy. I can see that. Um, but it's also proof that she's played this character before and knows it well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Uh. And but also Caduceus, it's later in the episode, but he has a moment where he's talking about, you know, we have this two spheres on board, one of them sort of clockwork, and he's trying to make these mm -hmm. grand connections, these fake connections, uh, when he's talking to Caleb. Yeah. Uh, and so both of them had that flavor in this episode. Yeah. Uh, which I thought was interesting. Well, and Jester now, first time really, that she's really tried to proselytize. Mm -hmm. And I felt kind of bad for both Laura and Matt. Okay. Because I think Laura wanted to RP some of that yeah. more than what got done. But I don't think Laura knew necessarily exactly how to do it and what to say. Yeah. Because I think she might have been worried that she's going to say something that isn't canon. I think that was probably her biggest concern. Mm, okay, yeah. And that's why when she looked at Matt, and then Matt sort of tried to tiptoe around the way that he thought that Jester would express right. the, the Traveler. And finally Matt just sort of got exasperated because I think he read in Laura that she wanted to RP it. Mm -hmm. And that's why he sort of flusteredly sort of cut himself off and said, well, you, need to, you know, you take yeah. over. Um, so, um, yeah. Going back to the spheres and the artifacts, so we may have to do some reworking of our overall theme because um, we've talked a lot about trammels and the trammels weakening and new trammels. However, we've got the dodecahedron, which is most likely pre-calamity. We've got this new happy, fun ball of tricks, mm -hmm. which is almost definitely pre-calamity. Oh, yeah. Uh, we've got two sword hilts that are pre-calamity. Two? Pretty sure it was two. What? Isn't there two? There's a... No, we have one sword hilt. I thought there was two. Um... Well, anyway, so the, why do you think we, we might have to rework it? Because I, I disagree. Okay, so, well, unless these are like the vestiges were. Yeah, these are vestiges. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, That's, but it just seems a lot is hinging, going to be hinging on these. And if you remember, the vestiges were to defeat the Chroma Conclave, not to defeat Vecna. They went and got the vestiges to defeat the Chroma Conclave. 
Yes, but in this story arc, the equivalent to the Chroma Conclave is the Jorhasian invasion. Is it the Jorhasian invasion, or is it Ukatoa and his siblings? Well, the Jorhasian, if they're following the Phoenix, yeah, that plays into that. Yeah. So I that's guess that's true. six of one, half dozen of the other. Um, but yeah, we're uh, getting a lot of these. But and, around this time is also in the first campaign when Matt introduced the first vestiges. Okay. Uh, uh, Tiberius's will of mending that he had mm-hmm. was one of them. Yeah. That's and true. they started the campaign with it. So he got it home game. Right. And that was about 7th, 8th level. Because they started the Craghammer arc, I think, at 8th level. Yeah, eighth and they were... Between 7th and 9th. Because yeah. in that game, they were doing XP and everyone got differing amounts. Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah. So that could be. But, uh, yeah, so we've got all these different um, things. And so, real quick, that the Happy Fun Ball. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and I'm not going to take credit for this. A couple of people did the math. And basically, one year outside the orb, or, or one year inside the orb, is equivalent to 1,140 years outside the orb. With the time dilation. Okay. They're wrong. Okay. How, how long do you think it is? I think it is random. I think it's just like the Feywild. I think Matt has a table back there. Okay. And because near the end of that, he rolled some dice. Okay. I can, well. And if it's planar and he, it was placed near the astral sea, but when you're traveling through the planes, sometimes time differences happen. Yeah. I don't think it's a straight mathematical okay. equation. Well, because the dragon I, says that even between the rooms within that concept that's where i was going i think the time only the different. time dilation is in the hallways not necessarily in the rooms themselves mm. and here's why if it was in the rooms themselves bo would have been waiting for hours on that boat before the next person popped out yeah but they all popped out one right after the other so the rooms time progresses normally. It's the hallways, the extra planar hallways between the rooms Yeah, that is varied. I see that. So, and that's where I was going. I used their calculation yeah. to come to that conclusion. Um, but even if it's different, like you're saying it is. Um, but I like the idea of that because that means less than a year has passed inside the orb from the Calamity, which explains why the dragon is still so young. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, that would make sense as well. So. Um, if you're keeping him that long to where he's only, you know, Well, this, so this could be the way that Matt lets Liam have an idea of somebody else who was messing with time. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And so, yeah. I, I think there's going to be time stuff in, that, in those books he ended up with. So, and, and the and, red one that they left behind, yeah. yes. Okay. Well, I think there's going to be just enough to wet his whistle to go back. Yeah, probably. Of Did course, we they're going to have to wait about a week for the fire elemental to go out. Uh, do you remember if we got a name of the wizard that the tower that they cleared out? Oh, we did, but I don't remember because when they were they were talking to someone and he said and they said that person runs the district. That's his tower. I don't remember the name though, but we did get okay. a name. 
Well, not the not the Sea Tower in Nicodronus. Oh, okay. The yeah. the the necromantic tower that they cleared out at the Capitol. Or not uh, the Capitol, no. The no, city that they were in. I don't. That they cleared out for the gentleman? Right, I don't. That we that. speculated had something, some connection with Vecna? Mm. Either a contemporary Oh, that or, first, first one? Yeah. Um, I don't remember if we got a name or not. Yeah, we did. The Spectre's name. The, the secret guy. Okay. He had a name. I don't remember what it is. Yeah, because um, I'm just thinking of this right now. Uh, but I think Matt's introducing all these people because they're going to be connected. Okay. Uh, and if that sphere is a vestige, mm-hmm. then Halas is a champion of somebody yeah. and would have been involved in the uh, construction of the Divine Gate or the banishing of the gods. That's true. Um, so, yeah, interesting developments. Um, some inter-party uh, tension and conflict mm-hmm. with not falling back on the halfling language to try to talk privately with Bo in front of everybody. Yeah. And Bo saying, get the fuck out of our business. And then yeah. apologizing. Yeah. Uh, and her asking to be the first mate. That, that was interesting. And I was like, "Is and it's probably just because I'm reading too much into it and I'm looking for drama where maybe none exists, but I was like, how does that play into our supposed leadership dynamics? Okay. Where we have supposed that Bo is sort of a swing vote between Caleb and Ford. And also, there was stuff about, you know, each Jester and Caleb both sort of invited uh, her to be part of the Mighty Nine. Yeah. Independent of each other. And Caleb just sort of announced it oh, officially. Oh, no, Caleb as, just made well, it. Well, yeah. He, he took that leadership role. Hey, I want to introduce you to, you know, the newest member. Yeah. So I was like, huh. That, so that creates an interesting... And, well, the, the interesting thing was their reaction. Oh, huh, you must have made an impression. Okay. He said it. Must be true. Yeah. Caleb's like the interwebs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he... Gets back, and that comes back to what Caleb and uh, Caduceus talk about later mm-hmm. in the episode. You just have an air of authority, yeah, about you. Um, yeah, I love that interaction mm-hmm. between the two of them. Um, their search finds cuteness and exposition. Um, last week, I talked about one of my favorite guest star appearances was on the C team Mm -hmm. when the guest star basically betrayed them. Yeah. Was actually a villain the whole time. Deborah's appearance on Critical Role might be my second favorite, but for entirely different reasons. Because, and I don't know if she went to Matt and said, I want to have a reason for being here, like I want to be, oh, how am I coming into this? Rather than just, they find me. I need to, I want to give them something. Um, and so Matt basically gave her the exposition that she needed to give. Yeah. And almost through none of it did she reference Matt. Yeah. She just said it. And I was like, they planned that. Yeah, they did. They most. I just don't did. know who, what side Initiated. of that equation yeah. it happened on. Um, yeah, no, they definitely planned that, and that's you know, it it's definitely a prime example of 
two DMs, but one being the player, you know, mm. coming into a new game. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Because, I mean, as a DM and a player, when I play, I like to have that stuff worked out, especially if I'm coming in mid-game. Yeah. I like to say, hey, you know, this is where my character's at. What do I, you know, go to the DM. What do I need to know? Yeah. I did that with Octavius yeah. uh, when my tiefling died. I did that in our Star Wars game with Tim, who's running that, when I jumped in on that one. Yep. Um, and that just, you know, that shows. And in her descriptions, it was obvious she's a DM, even if we didn't know that before. The way she described things. Yeah. It's like, ah, she's a DM. Yeah. Uh, and thrice, we got the phrase, this is how you get pinhead. Yes. And I loved that phrase. <laughs> I was on the same page. It was like, I thought it, he said it. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, it's the Hellraiser thing. You want pinhead? This is how you get pinhead. Yeah. See? It's the Hellraiser thing. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I love that so much. Um, but one of the things this hurts for our timeline that we've speculated on mm -hmm. is they're not going back to the Empire anytime soon. No. Uh, we were talking about how we thought they may or may not do the islands, the, right. the atoll. And then they'll get back to Nicodonis and get the hell back to the Empire. This is now the second mention of magic item dealers in Port de Mali mm -hmm. that we've had in three weeks. Well, in three game sessions. And and back alley ones. Yeah. You know. So I think we're going there. Yep. I think Sir Cadigan is who sold the paints. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, real quick. I have been racking my brain. I know I've heard the name Cadigan before, and I want to say it's a Disney villain. Ratigan okay. was the villain in The Great Mouse Detective. Okay, that's I'm probably just mixing it, but yeah. I was like, I know I've heard that name before, and I want to say it's a Disney, but I can't think of it. Yeah, Ratigan is a Great Mouse Detective. Okay. Uh, villain. Um, yes, uh, but we also see she's a victim of enchantment magic. Mm -hmm. So Sir Cadigan is an enchanter wizard. Which is arguably the most evil school of wizardry. It'll give necromancers a run for their money. I mean... Yeah, necromancy is typically evil and stuff, but I'm using a bag of meat. You're actually subverting a living person to your... I'm just using the body after they're done with it. Yeah. You I know, mean, to, to quote Jim Davis from WebDM. Yes. Uh, so that's going to be an interesting villain. And the nice thing about Matt making Cadigan an enchanter wizard is it's going to give them a preview mm -hmm. of Ikathon. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure he's an enchanter, too. Yeah. Yeah. So that will be interesting and nice. Uh, we also had um, the Caleb versus Tasha's hideous laughter. Yes. And they all got a... Very, and I, too, that. was very sad that he made the save. <laughs> yeah. And I love... I'm not a very happy man. Love that was it. a great line. Yes. There, so were, there were several just great one-liners in this. Yeah. Um, we also saw more of Ford's uh, jerk stream come out in this episode okay where he's joking about throwing uh, her overboard mm. and that anything that saccharine is you can't trust it yeah um yeah that which 
Which seems weird because she's very similar in personality to Jester. Uh huh. In that interaction between Ford and Bo, I think they're one of the reasons why Ford has been uh, a controlling influence for mm -hmm. Bo. Okay. Is because I think his initial reactions are all Bo's. Mm -hmm. And when he... It's sort of like when you want to learn something, the, one of the best ways to learn it is to tutor somebody else. Okay. I think that's how Ford is... That's why he does what he does with Bo. Okay. Uh, I think it's more than just a little joke. And maybe it just started off as a joke interaction between them at the table. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. But I think it's definitely grown into that sort of a thing where <laughs> Ford definitely takes on the asshole where that's his initial reaction and he's he has to pull himself back from that. Okay. And I think as Bo improves, he's getting worse. And they're beginning to yeah. meet somewhere in the middle. Um, I could be wrong. But that's what I got in that interaction. Um, uh, and speaking of Ford and one-liners and him, you know, and he's like, Jester, you keep an eye on her, which seemed like an odd choice to me. Hey, troublemaker of the party, keep an eye on the new person. Make sure they're not a troublemaker. <laughs> but he, he turns to Twiggy, he's like, I don't want to see any chocolate thumbprints in my quarters. No problem. <laughs> which then Jester had to reiterate, yeah, don't steal from us. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a good one too. Um, speaking of Jester and Twiggy, we start seeing some of Jester's jealousy issues yeah. creeping in, which kind of makes the dress up a little even weirder, darker. Because mm -hmm. now I'm wondering if at some point she tries to seduce Ford dressed in Avantika's clothes. <laughs> That's all that I can think of in that scene. Um, but. Well, I mean, my thought was she's wearing them because Ford slept with Avantika, maybe, <clears throat> you know. Yeah. But they rebrand re the ship. Twiggy paints it. Jester gets upset. Uh, yeah, she's like, this person's great, this person. Uh, she paints too. <laughs> Just like a flip of a switch. Yeah. So I'm interested to see how Traveler Con is going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you follow the Traveler too. That it was just mine. Or, well, the Traveler does this for me. Oh, he does that for you too. Oh, he does that for you too. Yeah. Oh, he does that for you too. Uh... So, yeah. It's, or, what do you mean he does that? He's never done that for me. That's going to be the big one right yeah. there. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so, if she wanted to paint a flag, it's only about 18 square feet of paint she needs. Yeah. Three by six feet is about what a big C flag is. Mm -hmm. Um. I loved the line, and what uh, Travis said that the ball eater is a ple pleasure barge. Yeah, and Matt lost it, and yeah. so did I. Yeah, it's like, uh... um. So one of the things I want to talk to you about real quick is uh, Halas's vault. Mm -hmm. Halas is awfully close to Halaster who is the Mad Mage, who built the Dungeon of the Mad Mage okay. in Waterdeep. Uh, do you think there's any connection? Or do you think it's just 
coincidence. I uh, think it's just coincidence. Um, uh, I, I don't have Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Nor do I. Um, I, for the most part, tend to stay away from the adventures. Yeah. Unless there's a good chunk of stuff that's like for players. Yeah. Like I picked up the uh, Tome of Annihilation, Tomb of Annihilation, because it had the two new backgrounds yeah. and a couple new things that you can get as familiars. Yeah. Uh, I did uh, pick up Strahd because to Ravenloft is a thing for me. Yeah. I, I know the creators, you know, blah, yeah. blah, blah. blah. Um, and that's got a background in it as well. Yeah. So, um, but. Those are the only times I pick if it's got a good chunk of stuff or yeah. is something that's, you know, I like if they had a Dragonlance one, I would probably pick that up because mm. I love Dragonlance too. Yeah. But other than that, I tend to stay away from them. Uh, great use of Liam Mid's Tiny Hut again. Yes. From Kayla. Yes. Uh, so good. Now. Wraith or uh, I was thinking Banshee. Banshee, yeah, um, yeah. Banshee's my pick for the black. Was that a troll? The humanoid mutated, bulbous, possibly. Because uh, when he when he was describing it, I was thinking the uh, the venomous troll. Yeah. The you know uh, that they fought in the swamp, the same type of you know the same type of description. I'm yeah, like, oh, that reminds me of that. You know, um, yeah. That that was my thought. I'm uh, saying, uh, but we saw the blue dragon, which was also depicted in that room. Yes. Um. So, we had a jar of marbles. I think it's those are beads of force. That's a shit ton of beads of force. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not think she's got it cornered with gunpowder. All I'm saying is beads of force would be awfully useful to a mage who's trying to stock his extra planar it's true. dungeon with creatures. That's true. So I think that those are his, those are his pokeballs. Okay. Um, I don't know if the doll was anything in particular. I am okay, and I have no s real evidence. The description seems to match the description, at least in my head. Um, but my gut says I'm ninety percent sure that it is the common magic item of the doll that you can give it three phrases and what words key those phrases and it will say those things at key points. Possibly. Or it is the reason that Hallis, uh, Hallis started messing with time magic. Okay. That could be, did you ever watch Voyager? No. Okay. There's a two or three parter episode called The Year of Hell. Okay. And it deals with the Krennin, who are uh, a power in the Delta Quadrant, and the main bad guy is using a time ship okay. to wipe things out of time because mm -hmm. he's trying to restore the time stream. Because that always works. Well. And he can never get it perfect. Uh, and he has a, a lock of his wife's hair temporal, uh, temporally suspended because she's one of the things he's trying to bring back. Mm. And she's the one thing that can that has never been brought back gotcha. in all of his manipulations. I think that that doll might be something like that. Okay, possibly. Um, but they took the jar of marbles. They took mm. the inkwell. Do you mm -hmm. think the inkwell is anything? Possibly, but it, I mean, it could be something more. My gut said it was just like 
the special inks for transcribing spells. Same, but I was thinking it was a never-ending inkwell. Okay, that of could those be. Inks. Yeah, that could totally be. Um, uh, and I was like, "What? Could I, I was like, what value would you put on that?" Uh, Depends on who you are. Bo, not much. Caleb, immeasurable. Yeah. Um, one of the books they took, public debate records uh, from Zydell. Mm-hmm. Or form of Zydell, something like that. Um, they took a spell book mm-hmm. and two mystery books that we don't know. Right. I think the debate is going to be about building the divine gate. Okay. I think. Uh, That's my guess. Um, Or it's going to be some other uh, major thing. Right. Uh, And possibly dealing with Ukatoa, the Phoenix, and it's going to be basically the trial of them. What what are we going to do about these things? Yeah. Um. So that's my guess. But Caleb finally has at least one spell book, uh, one a new additional spell book, and that was missing pages, I believe. A hundred pages. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. There was there were aspects of that whole thing that reminded me of Raceland and Fist and Dantilus. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of Dragonlands uh, allegory in, in Caleb's, Caleb's story. story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, or at least we see it easily. Yeah. Um, but they left the Ruby book and they left the doll mm-hmm. in the room. The thing that hit me in the feels the most in this episode was Jester's low on hit points. She cast Blink. Mm -hmm. She looks around. Nobody's there. She says, I'm all alone. And she chokes up and starts crying. Yeah. And even on my rewatch, I was just like, Uh, and I did a quick search on Twitter for Critical Role fan art and uh, at Axel C. Given actually drew that pit and it's a side by side of Jester in the now and Jester when she's a kid Oh god! and the ruby of the sea saying play inside dear and why in leaving yeah. Yeah, well, let, let's talk about that ending there for a minute because there's a couple of things and we're starting to get low on time. Yeah. Um, one, and I've seen this debated a little bit, you know, Jester could have taken the disengage action, not being not the brave. Yes, I, yeah, thank you for bringing us up because I wanted to. She takes the attack of opportunity to make sure, and I mean, you know, let's be honest. It could have had some features like we, you know, like uh, Sentinel, that where it can still take attacks of opportunity even with the disengage. I don't think it did, but well, and regardless, it doesn't come up much. It's a role play decision. Then using it other than as a bonus action for the rogues, it doesn't come up much. And I and people are like, and the other th- big thing I saw pointed out as a mistake, which I don't think was, I think it was calculated, was that not did not use uncanny dodge to have the attack of opportunity. Two reasons I don't think that that's a mistake. One, that happened on Nod's turn, and you can't use your reaction on your turn. Mm-hmm. Two, if he, if Sam could use it. He would have used it if it had done any more damage because it dropped him to one. Yeah. 
if it had done more than damage than it did, but he was like, it's, I'm still up. I can still get out. I'm just going to take it. Yeah. And I think that is arguably the largest example of uh, self-sacrifice that we've yeah. seen in this campaign. Um, because, yeah, uh, it's not a... Like, there have been others who have baited the attack of opportunity. Well, but none of them have a feature that guarantees they don't have to face them. Yeah. And does it anyway. Yeah. The other, well, this is the second time she's put herself in harm's way for another member of the party. Yes. Manticore fight. She kills the baby and takes the wrath of the mom. So that four doesn't get killed. Yeah. Yeah. So, not is not the brave. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you have anything else on that? Uh, there's one other thing in the end there I want to talk about, too. Not on that, other than that I wanted to pick your brain about, is there another example like of greater self-sacrifice than that? In this and campaign? I don't think there is. I don't think there is. Not either. yet. No. Um, I don't think we've... Not in this campaign. Yeah. Um, the other thing, after everybody's gone, and Twiggy's the only one left. Now, first off, we have to remember that the dragon already saw through the ruse. Didn't know who it was pretending to be Hollis, but knew it wasn't Hollis. She keeps the illusion up. She keeps the illusion up. She gets the, how do you want to do this? And right before it dies, she drops the illusion. And Matt's face and the dragon, he's just like, gets that smirk and like, Oh, okay. Like, a knowing. Like, I know who this is. I think she's been there. She may not remember, but I think she's been there before. I had not considered that. That look is not like, oh, it was an illusion. Because he already knew that this was some kind of illusion and it was someone else. It was, oh, it's you. Huh. Yeah, I hadn't considered that. And that's why she waited till then to drop it so he wouldn't recognize her. She said she hadn't been in the dark hole. She never said anything about not being in the rest of the place. And it's true. Matt stated you cleared two rooms out of a hundred room dungeon. Yeah. The place she was locked up could still be in that ball. Well, except they did pointedly ask her if she had been in the ball, and she said no. She said she's never opened it, and she said she wasn't in that hole. Because they asked her, was that where you were? The dark hole. Where they found the cloak and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I that's mean, how she knew Cadigan was going to use it for something evil. Well, that and if Twiggy, if they're keeping the same, like that, this character is the same character that Deborah's been playing, and it was brought here from another plane. Mm -hmm. Then the ball is a conduit for that sort of a transference. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Maybe she has been in and out of this thing. Yeah. A couple Maybe of times. Maybe not under her power. Yeah. But taken in another. Because when they went in the, the dark hole and found the cloak and the hand warmer and the boots, they said, is that where you were kept? And she's like, no, I don't remember that place. But they never asked her about the whole big labyrinth. The planar, extra planar labyrinth. True, but I think if if she had worked it out with Matt that she had been in there, I think she would have said something when they were crossing between the rooms. 
It would depend. Okay, and it would depend on whether or not she had knowledge. I mean, she could have been knocked out when she was put in the prison hmm. and just run through and escape somehow. Found one of the orbs and escaped. Because she said, you know, I used my illusion, he went one way, I ran the other and got out, you know, of the prison, but this could have been the prison. And then when I saw the ball, I knew he was going to use it for something bad, so I took it first. So that she wouldn't get caught, so that no one else would be trapped there. Yeah, maybe. that That's what my gut says. That look says she's at least met the dragon before, if not been there. And since it, they've only been through, and I'm not, I guess he's not counting the entryway because he said two out of a hundred rooms. I think it was. I think it, I thought it was. It was more of uh, acknowledging honesty in your foe and respect mm -hmm. given. See, but yeah, I, I, I don't mean, know. I, I saw it as, oh, it's you. Okay. And we don't know how old she is. We don't. She doesn't know. She doesn't know. And that could be the flipping of the time dilation between being in the orb and being out of the orb. Yep. The other great thing about how Matt handled Twiggy and the island and the repairs is the repairs are done. They can leave. Yeah. So top of the next episode, they can just leave. Yeah. And they can go to the uh, atoll, or they can head back to Nicodronas or Port de Mali. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're going to go to the atoll. Okay. It's still up in the air whether or not they're going to actually release Ukatoa. That I think go either have... way. I think we're going to have serious conversations, i.e. arguments between players, if he wants to give up one of the orbs, put another orb in, and get that power boost. Yeah. Caleb's going to argue it. If nothing else, just to pitch that, oh shit, this guy's going crazy, everybody, that we talked about last week. Caduceus is going to argue it. Caleb may not, and may even support Ford, if he learns that what he needs to do is of equal or greater evil than what Ford needs to do. Caleb gonna, is going to walk that line between letting Ford think he's supporting him and giving side glances like he did to Jester, and holy shit, what is going on? I can see that. Caduceus the thing is, though, I'd argue it. He has suggestion. Ford's weak save is wisdom. Yeah, that's true. If he doesn't want Ford doing it, Ford won't be doing it. Barring a really lucky roll. True. Uh, so. But the more powerful your allies slash minions, the more they can accomplish for you. Yeah. Happy minion is a productive minion. Yeah. And I'm still looking... I'm still hoping that we have Kuatoa on those islands. <laughs> because I really want them... I really want Matt to display the Kuatoa bringing their imagined gods yeah, into would existence. Be, that would be good. Because um, I think that's a great foreshadowing for Traveler Con. Mm -hmm. Um... I think they go to Port de Mali. Yes. Uh, and after Port de Mali, they head back to the Empire. Um, Do they free any Marids while they're in Port de Mali? I think that's going to have already been done. <laughs> Question in that regard. When they get to Port de Mali and they begin talking with anyone who has any sort of authority... 
do they mention that they faced Dashila and that they have identified why that particular part of the ocean is so dangerous? No. You don't think so? I don't think so. Okay. See, I was thinking that they did and that and to clean the slate for them? In, unless it leverages something for them, no. Okay. Um, it's not going to be hey, we did this, look at us, we're great, you know, or to get a way in, it's going to be, well, we have some, well, I've got information you need. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's going to be the yeah. only way. Um, real quick before we go. Okay. Um, tonight is the last talks of the year. Yeah. Thursday is the last critical role of the year. They will be coming back on the 8th and 10th respectively. We have decided that we also will be coming back on the 8th before yep. talks. So this will be our last episode of the year. Everyone have a happy Christmas and happy new year. Yes. Um, um, but yeah, I think for us and you guys who watch us, uh, having that schedule seems to work best Yeah, for us. It does. Um, um, of course, if you guys want to chat theories or anything, you can uh, use our chat here. When it posts to YouTube, you can use the comments there. Yep. Um, we appreciate all of you guys. Yeah. Uh, but we wanted to make sure we got that announcement so you didn't come in next week and get pissed because we didn't show up. <laughs> yeah. Um, I probably uh, will stream something that week okay. um, probably Stellaris um, with the new patch out the new update I don't have the expansion but the update has been a lot of fun uh, cool so I might do that awesome um, anything who's on talks tonight team? Sam and Matt okay uh, hopefully uh, someone asked about it. Was it him or Deborah? Yeah. For the exposition, uh, in PC, uh, PC exposition dump. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, and the other announcement that they made, Deborah is going to have her own show on Geek and Sundry. Yes. RBG starting well, if you in February. My rewatch on YouTube uh, of the episode every single commercial break. Yeah. Was that. Had that, yeah. Was the the twelve uh, second clip. Yeah, but that'll be coming out in February. I'm kind of excited for that. It'll have a cast, but then there'll be a guest star each week. Oh. Um and yeah, and actually I think it I think it's the guy that played Ward in Daredevil is gonna be one of the players. Huh. So yeah. Well I'm Ward in Iron Fist? Iron Fist, yeah, sorry. I, I think, I think. Well, she like Matt gets her co-stars. Yeah, tries to recruit her co-stars into it. So, uh, um, no, they were never on screen together. No, but they would have. Been I, I may be wrong. I can't remember what the name was, but I thought it was him. Huh. So interesting. Anyway. Um, do they go back into the ball? And how soon? Yes, if they're smart, at least a week after. No sooner than a week after. Because if those calculations those people did are correct, that I was basing my theory off of, which I think, it, like I said, I think it holds whether it's right or not. Uh, it's going to be a week before that fire element goes away. Right. Fair enough. Uh, I think they do after Caleb has devoured all four books. Okay. Um, or when should take him about seven days. <laughs> or when the itch to get that red one becomes too great. Yeah. Uh, so that's it for us, guys. We will see you on the 8th here on Twitch. And the following Thursday we'll post on YouTube. We'll see you guys later. Bye, guys.